Sunday. We hope the weather will hold off long enough for us to enjoy our worship and get home safely. Amen. So let's take a few moments. We're just going to go through our announcements quickly here. Um, today we are uh, regularizing our noisy offering uh, to the rescue mission. There is a uh, insert in the bulletin. I encourage you to read through it. Um, we do like to support all of our missions uh, organizations, and this is simply one that is uh, worthy of our attention. So uh, please consider that today. Uh, coffee hour will be happening across the hall uh, immediately following the service. So as always, you're invited to join with us in fellowship before heading out for the day. Uh, our prayer time uh, at 11 a.m. on Tuesday in the lounge. We encourage those who are able to come out and just express yourselves to our God. Uh, looking ahead, uh, next Saturday, uh, the men will be meeting at the Blue Dolphin at 8 a.m. So if uh, you're able to, uh, please come and join us. And it's always a good time of fellowship. Steve does a great job. He has a little devotional at the end of the meal. So it's not just talking. You know, you'll uh, worship him as well. So please join us. Uh, on the 4th, after um, morning worship, we'll be looking to do a, a hymn sing similar to the caroling that we did in December. We want to get out and uh, enjoy uh, those in our uh, church family who are unable to come out and worship with us in person for whatever reason. So we are going to take the worship to them after service. So if you're able to, please uh, come join us. Uh, we see our birthday listings as well. Um, and I'm sure um, Preacher Jim will uh, follow up on this as well, but in your bulletins you also see an insert of uh, an activity coming up on the 5th of uh, February of James Kelsey, so we'll allow Preacher Jim to expound on that as he chooses to. I think I've read everything that's in the bulletin. Unless somebody has anything else they want to share? Seeing as there is none. Uh, let us fill our hearts and minds as we enter into the spirit of worship before our God. Thank you, Susie. Now, let us stand for those who are able and sing our opening hymn, number 225. Come, Christians, join to sing. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, just a couple updates. Marilyn is in New York City, almost on her way home, and so that's a good thing. She had a beautiful trip with lots of um, beautiful pictures, so we'll be thankful to get her home. But she's there, see, her and Steve are very close, and I know Sue is going to see Bobby today, so that's also a praise. We've been talking about our memory verse for today is trust in the Lord with all our heart, right? Not part of our heart, and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make our path straight. And Susie and I are going to demonstrate something. So if you take a newspaper, and you look at it like you're supposed to be looking at it, there's something special, right? Almost always, if you tear it this way, it'll be a straight line, okay? Now, imagine we were looking at it, let's just see, like that. If, like, not the way we're supposed to look at it, this way. Can you try to do something straight? Wait. It doesn't make a straight line. And I promise you, this is usually the case. <laughs> but, and I brought some extras for you to show. Now, what does this have to do with our memory verse? Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make a path straight. Now, last week, remember we talked and you remembered about being in the corn maze, right? And being lost. And thankfully, the corn cop called down. But you know what the corn cop didn't do? The corn cop didn't come down and plow the field, right? He didn't, like, annihilate all the different obstacles. But what the corn cop did was to guide us through. And, and didn't it lift a lot of burdens? Wasn't it really easy? Trust the Lord with all your heart. I mean, not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. He's not going to take everything away, but the burden that's lifted when we can trust in the Lord. Now this morning, I've been reading through a little guide in the, or the Quest Bible. And this is a familiar, so this is my reading for this morning, Psalm 27. And I'll just, and it's going to be familiar, but I want you to hear it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. And it goes on to say, Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes. For faultlessness why rise up against me, sprouting malicious accusations. I remain confident in this, and I love this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Here, right? Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. He didn't promise that we wouldn't have troubles, right? But he promised he'd be with us, right? Let's sing our song for the last time and hide the words in your heart for our memory verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I'll bring this into coffee hour so you can play. And I promise I'll also pick up the mess later.
Thank you, Carol, for that uh, wonderful example once again. And we're at the moment in our service where we uh, take our burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Uh, our time of prayer and uh, just a time to be in His presence uh, fully in, in all that we do. So I encourage you to open your hearts and minds at this time as we stand before the throne of grace. And make yourselves available to our God. Please bow your heads. Our Father, our God, we just say thank you. We are thankful to you for this day, dear Lord. Uh, we're grateful because we know what the other days have been like. And we look forward to the future. But at this moment, at this time, we have this opportunity to be in your presence. And we are grateful for that. We're grateful for Jesus. For his immaculate uh, sacrifice on the cross in which he opened up the pathway back to you, dear Lord, one that we have chosen to take, dear Heavenly Father. So we just ask that you accept us as we are into your arms with whatever it is that is within us, Heavenly Father. You are the great God and we, your children, look to you for our strength, for our guidance, for all that we need in this world, Heavenly Father. And we know that you're able, willing and able, Heavenly Father, to do infinitely above anything that we can imagine, Heavenly Father. So we ask that you look down upon us, look down upon our church, family. We know that there are certain prayer concerns within our midst. We know that Sue was getting an opportunity to be with her son today, Heavenly Father. And so we wish her well. We hope the weather is amenable to her travels. We pray for, for Bill, who has uh, been away from us for quite some time. And we ask that you look down upon him and his health and his household as well. Uh, continue to keep him strong. We lift up Preacher Jen and Lori as well, Heavenly Father. Uh, we know that they have health concerns. And that there are others within our midst, Heavenly Father, who are uh, suffering with different ailments and conditions. We also have reason to be thankful and praise to you as well. Uh, Steve and Marilyn are on their way back. They apparently had a very good time. We thank you for allowing them the space to grow and enjoy time away. We ask Heavenly Father that you look into each of these individuals and situations and bless them and keep them and help them along the way, dear Lord. We now open up a portion of time in this prayer, dear Lord, for others who may want to add or share thoughts or prayers of their own as well, Heavenly Father. This time of prayer for the words that have been spoken and shared, but also for those things which have not been shared that may be too much to, to utter aloud, dear Lord. We just allow the Spirit to drive those groanings that only you can hear. And as we close our time in prayer, dear Lord, we just say thank you. And we ask for your continued blessings upon us as individuals, as a church family, and as a local community, dear Lord. Be with us in all that we do and all that we are. And it is in the name of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Ah. So, Next, we will sit, if you prefer, and sing hymn 21, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, verses 1, 2, 3, and 5.
Precious Father, we are thankful to you for another day, another opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth, and for the ability to give back to you just a portion of the many wondrous blessings you bestow upon us. We ask you, Lord, that you accept this gift from us to you as a token and symbol of our love and esteem for who you are and what you mean in our lives. We ask that you guide us in how we are to best use this for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. These things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the doxology. <laughs> Stay in Maryland coming back. They're late. <laughs> well, 
So that takes care of next month. Now, who's going to be going in March? <laughs> Can we just, we just kind of move it down? All right, I'll shut up. For now. I wrote my 
us have some notes. Thursday, a team will meet, the transitional ministry team will meet Thursday at 6. We had a meeting this past week. A lot of fun, a lot of action, a lot of looking forward. The month of March, halfway down to the end of March, the third Sunday in March, we're going to have an activity like you have never had before. And it's going to be at 11 o'clock. And it's not going to be in here. So just kind of get ready. That third Sunday in March. Fourth Sunday is Palm Sunday. And we'll have communion. And then the fifth Sunday is Easter. And so we will celebrate. All of these activities are leading up to Easter. But just be ready. It's going to be a little bit different, but it's going to be exciting. And so I'll keep you informed as we go along. So I did the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays in March. Jim Kelsey will be here Monday the 5th, that's Monday week, <clears throat> weather permitting and everything goes well. And Jim will be talking to us about uh, small churches calling part-time pastors and small churches going together and maybe two calling one pastor. And so he will be talking about that but in addition to that, on February the 1st, 8th, and 15th, at 7 o'clock, there will be Zoom meetings and informational meetings about the same things. And that will come from Jerry Hugano, who is Jim Kelsey's associate. And so if you want to be a part of that and tune in, to the Zoom, just let me know and I'll give you the coordinates and everything that you need to get signed into that and you can be a part of it that way. And then I put back under on the back, the round table, I put 15 of these books. The Life Book. Please take one, and when you're finished with it, give it to somebody else. This one happens to be on the Gospel of Mark, and, but it's written in a different way, in an understandable way, in a devotional way, and I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. And like I said, read it and then pass it on to somebody else. When you pass yours on to somebody else, let me know and I'll give you another. I've only got a hundred of these. So let's keep them going through school and through the community. Maybe when you go out next Sunday to sing, you can take some with you. But the life book on the Gospel of Mark, I encourage you to do that. All right. Oh, thank you for having the organ this week. Well, I did. I put this in and it sounded better. Yeah. It worked today. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5, we're talking about the resurrection of Christ. But at the same time, he gave direction to the church and to us. 
He gave us some fish bread. And I want to talk about that today. My main scripture for that comes from Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. With that one statement to his followers, and thus to us, Jesus told all of his future followers that they are to continually go fishing. That's you and I. Go fishing. With that one statement, we know that Jesus wants his followers to be in the fishing business. With that one statement, we know that Jesus wants his followers to be his fishing buddies. With that one statement, we know that when we go fishing, we will experience fish bites. As we talk about fishing, there is one thing without which we'll never catch any fish. When you go out to fish, you can have the best fishing boat money to buy, the finest rod and reel on the market, and you can be in a lake full of hungry fish. But if the fish are going to bite, you've got to have the right bait. Now, I'm not a fisherman. I never went fishing. My dad didn't go fishing. Neither one of my grandparents went fishing. We live in West Virginia on a mountain and there's no lake out there. There's nothing but us in the forest. No river. No place to go fishing if I wanted to. So I did a little study about fish bait. And I learned some interesting things. First of all, the best bait is always live bait, and it must be fresh. Next to having good bait, the correct presentation of the bait is another very important factor governing success or failure. Now, how many of you go fishing? Uh oh. Then none of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Other than you've never been. You're like me. We're in the same boat. I'd love to get a boat and go out on the river or go out on the lake. Summertime, I rent pontoons and just go enjoy. But I don't take a fishing rod. But we learn we cannot skip on the boat. You've got to be generous with it, I'm told. You've got to make it worthwhile to the fish to chase your bait. You've got to match the size of the bait to the size of the fish you're trying to catch. And then above all, the fish bait must be presented properly. As we do think about the type of bait we have to catch people. I want to remind you that according to the study I've done, fishing is simple. All you must do is go to the lake or the pond, bait the hook, throw your line in the water, and you're fishing. It never made sense to me 
to spend my time going down to the river or going down to the lake, putting a bottle on a line, putting a hook on there, putting a worm on there, and putting that out in the water and dare that fish to get it. Otherwise, just sit there and watch the water go by and watch the bottle going up and down. But when it goes under, then you got a fish and you've got to catch it right quick and bring it in. Or it'll get away. Never made sense to me to spend hours sitting on a creek bank daring a fish to take the bait. So I never did it. Never really learned how. I think I had put one worm on one hook and that was enough for me. Didn't want to do that anymore. That worm hadn't done anything to me. There's no reason for me to do anything to it. The reason why Jesus talked about fishing, he talks about us fishing for people. It's just as simple as fishing for fish. The problem is we have made it complicated. We have added scenarios. We have added possibilities. We have added, added responsibilities. When in fact all we're doing is witnessing. And our witness is our weight. The gospel, yes. The Bible, yes. Jesus, yes. All of those. The church, yes. I overheard a conversation not too long ago. No. The bait is simple because, as you're going to see, the bait is what we call the gospel. And the gospel is simple. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's simple. Jesus so loved the world. He came and he died for us. So simple. He's coming again. So simple. And we make it so difficult. It is so simple that no matter what your race is, no matter what your nationality, where you were born or where you're from, everybody becomes a Christian the same way. Everybody gets into heaven the same simple way. By believing and trusting. Not in me, not in the church, but in Jesus Christ. That's simple. The bait I'm going to share with you today answers two questions that make it easy to fish. It makes it so simple to catch fish. And it makes it both easy and simple for fish to become followers of Christ. What does a person need to do to become a Christian? And what does a person need to do to become a Christian? What does a person need to know? What does a person need to do? The answer is the same for everybody. It's as simple as a four 
letter word. S U R E. Sure. First John chapter five verse thirteen. I write these things unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may be sure that you have eternal life. First John chapter five verse thirteen. I write these things unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God, and that's Jesus, so that you may be sure that you have eternal life. How much simpler can that be? How much simpler, how much more sure can we be about our salvation? John, one of those early followers of Christ, said, you can be sure that you have eternal life. I want you to remember those four letters. I'm going to share with you four things today that begin with those four letters that give us universal bait. So you can fish anywhere to anyone. Anybody who takes this bait will know what they need to know to become a Christian and will do what they need to do to become a Christian. One, we need to see that we are a sinner in God's eyes and separated from Him. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. Oh, the Bible makes no exception, doesn't say, well, this one, that one, and then all have sinned. That's the first thing any person must know. If they're going to be a Christian, if they're going to spend eternity with Christ in heaven, they must know all are sinners. All of us have sinned. You'll never see God correctly through your eyes until you understand how God sees you through his eyes. He sees us for just as we are. We are sinners. Second, understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins and came back from the dead. Understand, Jesus died for your sins. Now, go back. You are a sinner in God's eyes. You're separated from Him. And Jesus died for those sins to bring you into fellowship with God. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 2 to 4, tells us that. This is the gospel in a nutshell. It's the only remedy for the sin problem. Jesus Christ alone lived a sinless life. No one else ever claimed to be perfect. Therefore, he alone could die a substitutionary death for our sins. Only Christ can do that. He alone has been raised from the dead. That is why he alone is the only way to heaven. Being a Baptist won't get you there. Methodist won't get you there. Catholic won't get you there. Presbyterian won't get you there. Church of God won't get you there. Only Christ will get you there. If you bypass Christ, 
on the cross, you never enter heaven. You won't even see that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The cross is both a bridge and a wall. It is a bridge to heaven for those who take it. It is a wall over heaven for those who reject it. There's a cross on that table back up. There's a cross on this table here. Jesus is up there. Cross. That's what we believe in. We Baptists believe in the cross. I look back on the back, I see the cross. I look out there in the hallway, I see a cross. Some people wear them. We believe in the cross. We acknowledge the cross. We accept the cross. Third, receive God's forgiveness for your sins by trusting Christ as your Savior. If you see that you are a sinner and believe in the concept of sin, then you understand the only remedy for sin is forgiveness. And that is exactly what a Savior does. A Savior provides forgiveness. If the world needed knowledge, God would have sent a teacher. If the world needed money, God would have sent a philanthropist. If the world needed technology, God would have sent a scientist. If the world needed peace, God would have sent a diplomat. But the world needs forgiveness. So God sent a Savior. He can be your Savior today. You can walk out that door this morning. No. Sins are forgiven, and you're on your way to heaven. Think about it this way. Sin is like a debt. And there's only two things you can do with the debt. You either pay it, or you declare bankruptcy. This is what a Savior does. He pays off the debt he does not owe for those who owe a debt that they cannot pay. <coughs> When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, He pays off your sin debt completely. The first thing you must do in order to be sure you have eternal life is to receive God's forgiveness for your sins by trusting Christ as your Savior. And the fourth thing, express your desire for Christ to be the Lord of your life. Jesus wants to do more than just cancel your sin. He wants to, literally, he wants to control your life, lead you and guide you where he can use you and where you can feel good about yourself, about what you're doing, and who you're doing it with. There is more to being a Christian than just going to heaven. The word saved <clears throat> means the same thing as to have eternal life. Understand that eternal life is not just the promise of living forever somewhere because everybody's going to do that. <clears throat> I've told you several times that's why we need to be fishing for people. Everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. 
And it's not the same as receiving eternal life or spending eternity with Christ. You need to understand eternal life is not just unending. It is life unlimited. It is not just eternal in quality. It is eternal in quality. It is a life that is right with God and spent with God for all of eternity. I shared with you this morning the two things you need to know to become a Christian. You've got to see yourself as a sinner in God's eyes separated from him and you've got to understand that Jesus Christ died for your sins and as God came back from the dead and I can't do that for you church membership doesn't do that for you only God can do that for you I've told you the two things you have to do to become a Christian. Receive God's forgiveness for your sin by trusting Christ as your Savior and express your desire for Christ to be the Lord of your life. And once you know what you need to know and when you do what you need to do, then no more. Can you know for sure you have eternal life? We're in the fishing business. Jesus wants us to be his fishing buddies. There are fish ready to bite. There are fish looking for the bait that we have. We've got the bait that can catch any fish. You are holding it in your hands. And right there. It is time for us to take the bait and to go out into the sea of humanity and go deep in the soul of fish. You want to take a bite? Take a little book. Plant a seed. Use the bait. Jesus. Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share the good news of the gospel with these thy people. And I pray that as we come to these last few moments together this morning, If there is any here that has any doubt at all about their position or their relationship with you, I pray that I have been able to say something, plant a seed, do something that would cause them to consider coming to you and saying, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I want to be your child. I want eternal life. And we will all be here singing to God be your glory. Amen. Stand as we sing. Number 56, to God be the glory.
church here in the office or across the hall in the fellowship. Our time together. May God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your attendance. And you too have a great trip. Thank you. Enjoy. We we'll look forward to having you back. God bless. Father, we thank you again for this day, for your son, and for these gathered here in your name. Just be with us, watch over us, and protect us on our way home. Lead us and guide us through this week, and let us become teachers of men. We pray this in your precious and holy name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless.